On December 10th, I was in Terre Haute, Indiana, uh, on the night that Brandon Bernard became the ninth person executed in the federal death chamber in 2020. His last words were more than three minutes long, but the part that has been widely quoted was the part where he apologized. He said, I'm sorry. That's the only words that I can say that completely capture how I feel now and how I felt that day. This is where we check in his press. I'm speaking to you right now in advance of the last three executions that have been scheduled by the Trump administration. And if those go through, uh, Trump's execution tally will stand at 13. These executions are the very definition of premeditated killing. Nobody makes an effort within the federal government to foster any kind of connection. Um, there's no uh, restorative justice kind of measures uh, in place to try to um, come to terms with this traumatizing event. So there's a lack of closure, but there's also a lack of healing or potential for healing. And, and that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Sometimes in spite of the system, it does happen. In my coverage, I've tried to talk about that a lot. On the night that Brandon Bernard was killed, there was a really large group at the Dollar General. The Dollar General sits directly across from the entrance to the penitentiary. It's the place where activists want to be on the, on the day of an execution. There was a lot of hope uh, up until the very last minute that Brandon Bernard's life would be spared. Brandon Bernard and Christopher Vialva were 18 and 19 years old when they were involved in the abduction and, and murder of a young white couple in Colleen, Texas. Christopher Vialva had shot Todd and Stacey Bagley in the head and Brandon Bernard, who was not there when they were abducted, had set the car on fire. The story became, in the minds of many jurors, that, that Brandon Bernard had, had essentially burned Stacey Bagley alive. Uh, so that was not true. What was really unusual and striking is that five out of the nine surviving jurors in this case were willing to speak up in support of clemency for Brandon Bernard. The death penalty is far too harsh for the, his level of involvement in this crime. I would first want to tell the Bagley's that I was saw. I would like to tell them that I have tried to be a better person. Despite his involvement in this terrible crime, when he was 18 years old, he had grown up to be a person who um, did a whole lot more good than harm in, in, wherever he was and, and, and who grew up on federal death row. My name is Pastor Aaron Chancy. I am the associate pastor of the uh, Bronx Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Bronx, New York. I'm telling you this for a reason. Um, Brandon and I, our friendship goes back 31 years. I was living in the streets too. I was, you know, I was out selling drugs. I was out robbing people. I was out doing all types of crazy stuff. And I thought that it would be good if I contacted him to try to, hey, try to help get him on the right path. I got robbed, right, for the half a pound of weed. Brandon called me. And I ran by him the situation and I said, Brandon, man, what should I do? You know, I know where dude is, man. I'm about to go get him. He was like, man, you don't want to be here on death row with me. But because of Brandon's words, I had to take the high road. And so that's why I can stand here today and say my name is Pastor Aaron Chancy of the Bronx Seventh-day Adventist Church because of his influence on my life. You're seeing in real time as the state takes another life and in doing so creates new new victims families and activists take turns tolling that bell at the at the moment of execution or the moment that activists believe an execution is being carried out you watch a murder man it stays with you a few months before Brandon Bernard was executed in Terre Haute, his co-defendant, uh, Christopher Vialva, uh, was actually the seventh person to be killed in the federal death chamber. On the morning of his execution, his mother, Lisa Brown, came uh, and spoke to activists and reporters who had um, gathered at the Dollar General. To Todd and Stacy's family, I am so sorry for your loss. 
I've never been able to tell you that because I was told I could not have access to you. My son wants you to know that he is deeply remorseful. It was clear from hearing from the family of Stacy and Todd Bagley that at least for Georgia Bagley, the mother of Todd Bagley, that apology was really important to her. And I would also like to add the fact that they regretted their acts at that time helped very much to heal my heart. And I can truly say I forgive them. Um, there's no measures uh, in place that would allow somebody like Lisa Brown to be in touch with somebody like Georgia Bagley. And that's part of the cruelty of this system too. And, and that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. When Timothy McVeigh was executed in 2001, some of the voices that came out in opposition to his execution was a man named Bud Welch, whose daughter had actually been killed in the Oklahoma City bombing. And he actually forged a friendship with McVeigh's father. The punishment of the death penalty is uh, nothing more than revenge. And one cannot go through the healing process at all when you're living with revenge. The minute Trump leaves, we know that the executions in Terre Haute are going to stop. And a lot of us are going to breathe a sigh of relief because we're all tired of going to Terre Haute and seeing this kind of um, death and destruction. So there are three more executions scheduled to happen before Trump leaves office. Lisa Montgomery, who is scheduled to be killed on January 12th, followed by uh, Corey Johnson, who's scheduled to be killed on January 14th. And finally, the day after that, uh, Dustin Higgs, who's scheduled to be killed on January 15th. Corey Johnson and Dustin Higgs both tested positive with, uh, for COVID, both got sick. Lawyers for Dustin Higgs and for Corey Johnson are arguing that the already existing risk of this harrowing death um, has been heightened by the fact that their clients have um, contracted COVID with symptoms. I mean, Lisa Montgomery received the death. Lisa Montgomery has been on death row since 2007 for the murder of a pregnant woman um, and then the abduction of her unborn child. Uh, it's also the kind of crime that fairly clearly is driven by severe mental illness. There was a Zoom conference yesterday with her attorneys who opened the call by showing a photograph of a trailer um, in Oklahoma that um, was constructed by Lisa Montgomery's stepfather. She was repeatedly raped and then was uh, essentially trafficked. One of the most powerful voices right now advocating for Lisa Montgomery is, is her sister. We started out both in a horrific situation. The state of Kansas came and took me. Lisa stayed in that home and it continued on, continued on worse than what it was when I was in the home. And it took me years and years to overcome it. But I also had a good foundation that helped me overcome it. Lisa did not have that foundation and she was broken. And so the fact that we are now here uh, is certainly due to Trump and, and Bill Barr. Death penalty, bring it forth. On the other hand, I think it's really important to understand that this has been a bipartisan project. If you are a major drug dealer involved in the trafficking of drugs and murder results in your activities, you go to death. However belatedly and opportunistically, Biden decided to adopt uh, a stance against the death penalty. It's really, really unclear what this opposition to the death penalty is going to mean. Biden himself has said nothing about these executions. There's a lot of concern and skepticism that Biden will not take more ambitious steps to try to really end this thing in a meaningful way.